It is difficult to overstate the historical significance of Demon Slayer the movie Infinity Train, which has been unlocalized as the movie Kimetsu no Yaiba Demon Slayer Mugen Train in the States to avoid confusion with Cartoon Network and HBO Max's American Isekai of the same name, something I should probably watch and cover at some point. Now, those kind of branding choices do risk hurting an anime film's international marketability but considering that this was the top grossing film worldwide in 2020, the first non-Hollywood film to ever do that, and the highest grossing Japanese film ever made, surpassing even the Oscar-boosted Disney-distributed Spirited Away by a cool hundred million, I'd say it paid off and then some. It's also the highest grossing R-rated animated feature in history, but that's more a sign that the MPAA is full of pearl-clutching pansies than it is of any maturation in American animation tastes. This is as intense and adult as your average Marvel movie. Of course, the absence of those at the box office last year and an ongoing lack of theatrical releases this year do put an asterisk next to those records. Mugen Train was lightning in a bottle lucky to release alone during a period of lax pandemic restrictions when all of Japan was looking for an excuse to go out, and its release has had an unusually long tail overseas. Still, any way you slice it, the film's achievements and the overwhelmingly positive response it's garnered domestically and internationally are quite impressive and will doubtless have a major impact on how anime films are produced and marketed both in Japan and overseas moving forward. But does it live up to all that hype? That's what I've been wondering, cooped up in Canada, waiting for either my second dose of Pfizer or some kind of home release to check it out for myself. This week, Funimation finally let me get my answers by putting it out on their streaming service, which has recently become substantially more usable, good even, thanks to updates to their console apps. And now I can pass those answers along to you in the form of a mostly spoiler-safe review, uh, save for a more in-depth Animele-style analytical section toward the end that I'll warn you about when it's coming up. That rollout is sadly limited to Canada, the US, Australia, and New Zealand, but with today's sponsor, ExpressVPN, that needn't be an issue no matter where you live. By rerouting your connection through one of their high-speed servers in 94 different countries, ExpressVPN lets you browse like you live there. So US users can also watch all the Ghibli on Netflix Canada, all while encrypting your data and masking your identity from hackers, governments, ISPs, and anyone else who might be looking. And it does it all with apps and plugins that make hopping virtual borders on your PC or phone as easy as clicking a button. With a bit more know-how, you can even install ExpressVPN right to your router, extending that freedom to every device you own, which has the added benefit of protecting your console gaming sessions from DDoS attacks and letting you pay cheaper regional prices for games, DLC, and in-game items. I used the easy-to-follow tutorials on their site to get my router set up without my much hassle, and even if you do run into problems, their excellent 24-7 customer support team is always there to help you solve them. If your router isn't compatible, they also have links to buy one with ExpressVPN pre-installed. To open up your internet experience and find out how to get three months of ExpressVPN free, visit expressvpn.com basement or click the link in the doobly-doo today. To get the obvious out of the way up front, from a production standpoint, this film is breathtaking. Ufotable's CGI compositing game is unrivaled even on a TV schedule, and with the time a film production allows to meticulously craft every shot, even with the complications caused by COVID, their team has done even more impressive work. Unique, intricately detailed trees sway dynamically in the wind, casting soft, complex moving shadows on the 3D and environments and 2D characters beneath them. Steam billows up from the titular train engine, its heat bending the light as it passes before the camera. Our heroes will spend much of the movie inside its cars, lit by the warm glow of its tungsten bulbs, which cast deep, 
convincing shadows across their clothes and faces whenever they flicker ominously. We also spend some time atop it in a cool haze of fog and steam that reduces the trees zipping by to faded shadows and gives the obligatory rooftop fight scene an incredible feel of layered depth. And because the train serves as the set for most of the film, all of these areas are meticulously modeled with an incredible level of immersive, period authentic detail. And while, just like in Ufotable's TV shows, all of these fancy high-tech effects are used to compensate somewhat for actual animation that's often a little stiff, emphasizing consistent fidelity to complex character models over smooth motion with high frame counts, that compensation is as undeniably effective as it ever was. 3D director Kazuki Nishiwaki is a master of building worlds that feel both alive and lived in and no matter how many of their productions I see, the seamless way that director of photography Yuichi Terao inserts anime into those worlds never stops being magical. In its lighting, framing, use of color, and especially the copious 3D camera movement that plays into its action scenes, Mugen Train feels intensely cinematic, and that feeling is only bolstered by soaring orchestral music and bassy, punchy sound design that made me very very happy to own a home theater system. Suffice it to say, if the aesthetic experience of anime is something you care about at all, you are going to have a blast with this one. I had such a good time that if I can get my second jab while it's still in theaters, I'm going to watch it again just to see how it looks on the big screen. But of course, that still leaves the question, what about the story that's being told with all this impressive imagery? Well, as is the case with most shonen anime movies, it's basically more of the TV show, only bigger and better, so if you like that, you'll like this. And unlike the filler spin-off movies that most shonen franchises get, Mugen Train is actually a direct, plot-essential continuation of the anime, adapting events from the manga that take place mere days after it ended. So you'll get to see the characters actually grow and change in significant, lasting ways ways over the course of this movie, and if you're planning to keep watching the TV show, it's kind of essential viewing. On the other hand, if you haven't seen the anime yet, and you're wondering if this makes for an accessible jumping on point, the short answer is no. The longer answer is no, comma, but it does establish the core concepts of the series and the personalities of its central cast effectively enough that newcomers won't feel totally lost. You can tell exactly what kind of guys Sentaro, Zenitsu, and their gracious, talented, handsome boss Inosuke are just from how they behave while boarding the train, and Nezuko's appeal is immediately self-explanatory the second she appears. The movie's themes and plot are also neatly self-contained, making it a solid sampler of basically everything the broader series has to offer in terms of action and emotional content. It's not the strongest example of either, but it is a well-balanced blend of all the Demon Slayer vibes. Those vibes being broody, moody, nighttime fights, existential angst, pity slash empathy, laser light show wrestling hype, therapy, heartwarming family bonding, and Inosuke. <laughs> So if you're looking to find out in the shortest amount of time possible if the rest of the anime is your thing and being a bit confused won't get in the way of that, or more likely for viewers of this channel, you're wondering if it's a good way for you and your less anime-obsessed friends to enjoy a long-awaited post-vaccine night out, or in, I'd say go for it. Just make sure you book some time off for an at-home marathon session not long after, because if the fact that the original manga nabbed 24 of the top 30 slots on 2020's Oricon sales charts is any indication, this movie's a hell of a compelling sales pitch. Like most Demon Slayer stories, the setup for this one is pretty straightforward. Tanjiro has questions about the Hinokami Kagura breathing technique that he awakened to in his fight with Rui, and the flame Hashira, Kyojuro Rengoku, seems like the most likely man to have answers. Thus, our four heroes board a midnight train looking for him, only to discover that he's there on a mission to investigate the mysterious disappearances of several passengers, including some lower-ranked demons. 
demon slayers. The train does, of course, turn out to have a demon problem, otherwise they would have named the movie something different. And as is so often the case in this series' fast-paced, densely packed arcs, our heroes barely have time to say hi and get their tickets punched before they come under attack. Though with the elite sword skills of a Hashira at their disposal, it doesn't take long to finish it. Or so it seems. Prepare to get mind-freaked if you've never seen a single other movie before, because that too-easy fight was actually a dream. The ticket punch was the real attack, and the moment the lights flickered, our heroes were dropped into a dream world where all of their dearest desires are made manifest. Which, in both Zenitsu and Inosuke's cases, involves hanging out with Nezuko, and really, who can blame them? The heroes are tempted to linger forever in pleasant dreams bit isn't exactly novel, even for shonen anime, but it's still an effective and efficient way of establishing more of Kyojiro's character before the fighting breaks out, and it does allow the film to dig deeper into Tanjiro's trauma over the demon attack that killed his family. Dredging up and weaponizing those feelings also makes the central villain immediately and immensely hateable, though that's not exactly new to these sorts of stories either. The dream world does get more interesting and informative when we break away from the obvious desires highlighted in these fantasies and start exploring each hero's subconscious. Inner Zenitsu, presumably the part of him that's so good with a sword, is just incredibly fun for the brief bit of time he's on screen, as is Inosuke's inner beast. Tanjiro's warm, empathetic inner world is predictably beautiful, and while the flame Hashira's subconscious is exactly what you'd expect, the way his inner fire manifests IRL is very fun. Though obviously the real fun only gets started after they break out of the dream and start fighting in earnest, which is, let's be honest, 90% of what anyone goes to any shonen movie to see. And I am happy to report that the three big fights in this one are all worth the price of admission thanks to kick-ass choreography and camera work, a near non-stop stream of badass moments, a touch of psychological strategery, and strong, despicable villains. All told, they elevate what's kind kind of a B-grade film in terms of atmosphere and character writing to a solid A-. I will say that the demon baddies aren't quite as interesting or multifaceted as those we met in the last season of the anime, but they do work well as threats and motivators within the film's limited runtime, and their human flunkies, who are relatably driven by a desire to escape their traumatic reality and meet lost loved ones in the dream world, still allow Mugen Train to maintain that trademark demon slayer sense of empathy toward the enemy. Now that is about all I can say without delving into spoilers so let me sum up my final thoughts on the film for anyone still on the fence about seeing it before I move on to light fight analysis for the folks who already have. Demon Slayer, colon, Kimetsu no Yaiba the movie, colon, Mugen Train is not the greatest anime movie in existence by any stretch of the imagination, but I can absolutely see why it did the numbers it did. The near-perfectly optimized shonen battle pacing and broadly appealing emotionally charged narrative that characterize the show and manga are on full display here, enhanced by mirror-polished production values and thrilling action set pieces that make for a hell of a theatrical experience. It does not break the shonen movie mold or even expand it, but what it does do is fill it out completely with no bubbles and almost zero flash. If you want to have a fun anime time at the movies that'll give you a little but not too much to think about once it's done, and who doesn't after the year we've just had, you really can't ask for much better. Now let's get into those fights and spoilers. The solo duel between Tanjiro and Enmu is intentionally anticlimactic, and it is a bit of an odd choice to have two fake-out fights back-to-back, -back, but I think it ultimately works, because this is our first time really seeing how all the training our boy did in the final arc of Season 1 has paid off. Not only can he hold his own against a lower-ranked Demon Moon like Rui now, he's able to keep him continually on the back foot with a combination of razor-honed fighting skills and an iron will that makes 
breaking through the constant barrage of illusions trivial. As a final desperation play, Enmu tries to shatter it by turning up the heat on Tanjiro's survivor's guilt, having his family blame him for their deaths in a trichromatic nightmare that gives us some of the movie's most striking imagery, but it backfires, flash forging his will into pure steel as rage overtakes his trademark sense of empathy. And it is honestly cathartic after all these times that he's found the humanity buried deep within apparent monsters to see Tanjiro just absolutely fucking lose it on a villain who absolutely unequivocally deserves it. Of course, that's just the beginning of the real fight, but had Enmu not fused his being with the train itself, just as Inosuke predicted, Tanjiro would have taken him down single-handed. He's truly come a long way. Still, even with all that skill, there's only so much he can do on his own to protect the train's passengers, so it's finally time for the rest of our heroes to wake up, or in Zenitsu's case, sleepwalk like a badass and join the fight. The effects work throughout this whole section is stunning, and the sheer scale of the battle feels like something out of a co-op Shadow of the Colossus. Everyone gets their own moment to shine and save lives, and it all builds up to a thrilling two-on-one encounter between Inosuke, Tanjiro, and the demon's head, which has consumed the entire train engine. The demon's hypnotic eyes keep sending them to sleep, complicating their approach on its weak point, and it uses its knowledge of how Tanjiro escaped those dreams the first time to very nearly trick him into killing himself. But Inosuke's sharp instincts cut through the deception as surely as his serrated blades rend the demon's flesh. And together, breathing and moving in perfect sync through a twisting mass of tendrils and evil eyes, the pair lines up a devastating combo attack, which, as connoisseurs of Chrono Trigger can tell you, is the best kind of attack, to strip away all of Enmu's defenses and sever his oversized spine in one clean Hinokami Kagura strike. That does send the train careening off the tracks, which could be very bad, but thankfully Kyojiro's raw strength allows him to save every single passenger from certain death in the wreckage. It's a triumphant moment for all involved, but tragically the film's not quite over yet. While Tanjiro's busy giving his all just to keep his blood in his body, the upper third-ranked Demon Moon appears out of the blue to attack, and it's down to the Flame Hashira to defend against him. As villains go, Akaza isn't the most nuanced or interesting. He's your standard strength-obsessed shonen baddie who's given up his humanity in pursuit of immortal power and tries to tempt Kyojiro into doing the same, only to be flatly refused because it's as weak a sales pitch as it is a motivation. However, once their fight pops off and keeps popping off for a solid 20 minutes, you do start to see where he's coming from. Like, yeah, if these two did the whole Vegeta-Goku rivalry thing, just two demons beating the ever-loving shit out of each other every day forever, I'd watch the ever-loving shit out of that. Neither of their powers is particularly complex, it's just flame slices versus shockwave punches, but they come out in such a rapid, mesmerizing flurry, and the big blows they land have such an intense impact that it's impossible to look away. This is anime action at its hypest, two warriors at the top of their game pushing their bodies to and past their absolute limits. And even when the difference in those limits catches up to us and leads to an inevitably tragic conclusion, Kyojiro's badassery remains unshaken. Only true anime fighting legends like Moomin Rider have ever done something as hard as trapping a guy who's punched through their stomach with sheer abdominal force so that they can cut his goddamn head off with what's left of their strength. Ultimately, the demon does break out of it, lizard style, by detaching both his arms and scuttling off into the shadows before the sun or other demon slayers can get him, but Tanjiro is right. Dead or alive, Kyojiro Rengoku won that fight not just by saving the passengers, but by protecting four brave and talented young slayers whom the laws of shonen escalation ensure will grow to surpass him one day and take down all those demon moon bastards in the end. 
It is just the right sort of bittersweet note for a Demon Slayer movie to go out on. And it helps to cement the film's overarching theme that it does not do to dwell in dreams or fixate on the past. We must keep pushing forward through life's hardships, but if we do all we can for others in the time we're given, when we do reach its end, we can at least meet our lost loved ones with pride. A message that, even as a non-spiritual person, I find to be both comforting and motivating. I may personally be fonder of more esoteric, boundary-pushing shonen like Chainsaw Man and Jujutsu Kaisen, but Demon Slayer is just that good at driving straight to the core of the human condition. Let me know in the comments below what you thought of the movie and of this review, and if you're looking for more timeless, battle-oriented anime entertainment, check out my recommendation video on Metabots, which is basically what Pokemon would have been if Gynax made it. Or if you want to see some anime films that really earn their R ratings, my recent celebration of the joys of cartoon violence has a few good suggestions. I'm Jeff Thu, professional shitbag, signing out from my mother's basement.